This podcast includes information provided by the issuer and does not express the views of the interviewer. This podcast may also include forward-looking statements by the issuer that involve certain risks and uncertainties to its business. Because forward-looking statements are subject to risks and uncertainties, the issuer's actual results could differ from those indicated in this podcast. Welcome to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and thank you all so much for the support and for tuning in. You can follow Planet Microcap on Twitter at Bobby K. Kraft, that's B-O-B-B-Y-K-K-R-A-F-T, and you're listening to episode 82. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to tweet at me or shoot me an email at rcraft at snnwire.com. And when you do get a chance, if you like what you hear, please rate and review Planet Microcap on iTunes. It really helps provide feedback for me and spread the microcap message. So as some of you might know, we are hosting our annual microcap investor conference, the Planet Microcap Showcase coming up in Las Vegas, April 30th through May 2nd, 2019 at Bally's Hotel and Casino. I wanted to take a quick second to let you know that we have announced our initial speakers and they are posted on our website at www.planetmicrocapshowcase.com. It's a who's who in the world of microcap. Starting with our keynote speaker, Tobias Carlisle, author of The Acquirer's Multiple, Connor Haley, the current number one ranked investor on the Microcap Club, as well as returning speakers, Jason Hirschman, Brandon Mackey, Chris Lahiji, Maj Don, Paul Andriola, and more. We have more surprises to come, but don't wait. Be sure to register to join like-minded investors and companies at the premier event for the Microcap community. And now to business. For this episode of the Planet Microcap podcast, I spoke with Alan Brockstein, founder of 420 Investor and New Cannabis Ventures. The last time I had Alan on the program was approximately three years ago, and to say things have changed in the cannabis space would be the understatement of the century. As you will hear, Alan has been following and covering the cannabis industry and providing a capital markets perspective on all the regulations, issuer news, and how that affects the industry as a whole. In this interview, we discuss how the cannabis industry has matured, as well as how that has affected the way Alan approaches considering a potential new cannabis investment. Thank you again for tuning in to episode 82, and please enjoy my interview with Alan Brockstein, founder of 420 Investor and New Cannabis Ventures. But first, a word from our sponsor. To my loyal listeners, subscribers, and fans, Robert Kraft here, your host on the Planet Microcap podcast. The 2019 Investor Conference season is upon us. Where are you going this year? I'd like to take a second to invite you to join me and maybe a few of the guests you've heard on this podcast to our annual Microcap Investor Conference, the Planet Microcap Showcase, April 30th to May 2nd, 2019 at Bally's Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. The Planet Microcap Showcase will be two and a half days of company presentations, networking opportunities, an educational workshop, and you will get to meet privately in one-on-one meetings with the management of well-known emerging growth private and publicly traded microcap companies. We are back with new surprises and programming that you will not want to miss. So join us for the Planet Microcap Showcase, April 30 to May 2nd, 2019 at Bally's Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. For more information and register to attend, please visit www.planetmicrocapshowcase.com. See you in Vegas. For this episode of the Planet Microcap Podcast, I would like to welcome Alan Brockstein, founder of 420 Investor and New Cannabis Ventures. Alan, welcome back to the Planet Microcap Podcast. Hey, it's great to be back again. It's great to have you back and uh, thank you for joining me. So for those who missed our first interview, you know, what is your background and how'd you get your start looking at microcaps and the cannabis industry? Yeah. So the microcap part's funny because that certainly was never my intention. And uh, the start was in uh, early 2013. So I'm going to cross six years next month. And uh, I was at the time a pretty prolific contributor to Seeking Alpha. And uh, and I also read a lot there. And uh, somebody wrote an, a negative article about a cannabis stock and it caught my attention uh, because number one, I didn't know there were cannabis stocks. And number two, 
I was a little bit out of it, Bobby. I didn't even know that cannabis had been legalized uh, by the voters anyway in Washington and Colorado. I was a little slow on the uptake there. And so it was really interesting to me because, uh, number one, I, I was always a cannabis legalization advocate, uh, not a highly informed one, but as, as a libertarian, just somebody who believed in it, period. And then uh, also it was really interesting to me that – uh, that these stocks were trading and uh, attracting attention, but they were total crap companies. So uh, over the next few months, I spent a lot of time learning not only about these uh, few companies that were uh, purportedly cannabis companies, but uh, more importantly, really learning more about the social justice and medical issues uh, that that were behind legalization. And so, uh, you know, coming at this from certainly somebody that didn't know a lot, I had to get up to speed. And over the next uh, six months or so, I was starting to write some articles on Seeking Alpha, and my readers were uh, really digging it. And I decided to uh, take a jump at creating a subscription service. I already had a subscription service uh, that was a uh, you know trading-oriented service on I had two of them actually, but one of them was on my partner MarketFi, which is owned by Benzinga. Uh, it was already on their platform, and so uh, it was in mid-August of 2013. Uh, it was right after uh, the uh, Sanjay Gupta uh, weed came out, if I recall, mm -hmm. and that was something that really caught my attention, uh, uh, making me believe this was going to be a real mainstream topic when you had the CNN chief medical officer, uh, medical whatever reporter, whatever they call them, <laughs> to, to talking about it to ordinary Americans. And so uh, I called up my partners at, uh, at MarketFi and I said, you know, you guys don't have to do this, but would you be open to it? And they, they, they said, let us talk about it. And literally, Bobby, 30 seconds later, they called me back. They said, we're in. And so, uh, and then right after that, the coal memo uh, came out. That was at the end of August, 2013. And I had already decided to start the service, but that really solidified it because up until that moment, it wasn't clear if the states, even though the voters had approved, would actually move forward because the federal government hadn't provided any response between November 2012 and the summer of 2013. So long story short, I was in the right place at the right time, fascinated, and I saw my calling, Bobby. All right. So, Alan, so that, so all of that background, that is what really led to then new cannabis ventures and 420 investor, correct? Yeah. So the timing of that was the, the first uh, couple of years, it was just 420 investor. And, uh, you know, we went through the meteoric rise of these silly penny stocks uh, when Colorado legalized ultimately in uh, early 2014. So about four months later and uh, the market uh, uh, crashed and burned. I mean, it was terrible. And so, uh, one of the things that I learned during that time was that people really valued my ability to filter news and uh, and to kind of weed out uh, you know a lot of the noise and so no pun intended yeah exactly <laughs> and so uh, we had companies reaching out to me and I, I you know I didn't work with any companies or anything at 420 Investor it was just a subscription service and uh, it, it became very uh, obvious to me that there were a lot of people out there that weren't going to pay. A subscription, but we're looking for this kind of news. And there were also a lot of companies out there that wanted to connect with people. And so our vision in September 15, when we launched, uh, was to create a, a place on the internet where people that were serious about investing in the industry or, or serious operators could essentially connect and not necessarily person to person, but could read about each other and learn about each other. And so that was what we did. And, and we because of my uh, job, you know, working with investors at 420 Investor and wanting to be as uh, conflict-free as humanly possible, uh, I, I said, okay, this was an advertising model. I said, I will work with private companies. We weren't soliciting or anything like that, but I said, I can't work with, with public companies. And so that first year, we had no public companies. And quite honestly, we didn't have much revenue. We had a few private companies. Uh, we were building our audience, establishing our reputation, and then exactly a year later, September uh, – well, October 1st, 2016, and the timing was just beautiful. We, 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 we faced a crossroads because one of our private companies was going public, and so uh, 
One thing would have been to say, hey, see you later. You're public. We got to boot you off. Mm -hmm. But the reality was we had other public companies reaching out to us wanting to be on our platform. And uh, I realized that if I didn't figure out a way to work with these companies, that somebody was going to – either they wouldn't have that possibility or someone else would come along and just copy kind of what we were doing, building a credible place and taking that business. And so uh, I had a tough decision to make because it, it put me uh, – it compromised my objectivity potentially. I don't think it actually did, but potentially on paper. And uh, so we, we took two, two clients that were public at the time. I think uh, I'm really proud uh, of our first two clients. They're still clients, uh, Canopy Growth and Aurora cannabis, both in Canada, LPs. Uh, by the way, uh, I know, uh, so I just disclosed their clients and they're still clients, but I have no position in either of those companies. I've never invested in a cannabis stock, which is a, a question I get a lot, but it's, it's that conflict of interest thing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and from there, we, we were just in the right place at the right time. And, a, uh, we, we picked up a nice, uh, uh, group of, Mainly Canadian uh, LPs, but now we've really picked up some great U.S. companies, and we continue to serve. Now the private companies are, are really uh, benefiting from our platform as well, Bobby. So that that's kind of the, the timing of everything. Gotcha. So you know, since our, our our well, our last interview on here was in April 2016, and uh, it was one day before 4:20. So for those who were clearly thinking that, you know, so that was a that was almost three years ago. I can't but, believe it was that long ago. I know. I well, that was on sure. that. That was on here. The la we did a we did our, our an interview um, uh, for for our for Stock News Now um, about a year ago, talking about okay. the, the Cole memo. That Got we, it. we did that one, but but on here specifically, uh, it's been about three years. Got it. Okay. And, and and at that time, you actually that was when we really introduced you know some of the pitfalls and what to look for, what to look out for in cannabis industry at at that time. And, and as you've uh, kind of already mentioned a little bit that a lot has changed since then. So, you know, th what, what would you say are some key things as an investor that have happened since April 2016 that have affected how you look at potential investments in the cannabis uh, industry? Yeah, well, it's been radical. Uh, I, I wish I knew a word that was stronger than radical because it's been incredible, uh, the changes. And, you know, when I came into this in 2013, I was kind of like the, the sheriff of the Wild West. And it was very disappointing to me because as great as the cannabis industry seemed and all this good stuff going on with the private companies that I was aware of, uh, the public companies were uh, – oh, this may be, be a PG-rated show, but they were – a I was going to say a sheet storm, but uh, <laughs> I don't know if I'm allowed to use language like that on your podcast, but it was nasty. And uh, so what we had back, even in 2016, uh, we, we had a lot of companies that didn't file with the SEC, first of all. That, that's no longer really acceptable, although there are a few of those. We had no access to capital. It was all toxic convertible notes for the most part. We had very little revenue. So if you flash forward, and you, you don't have to flash forward necessarily to today, you could have flash forwarded really to a couple of different points in time. I'm happy to elaborate, but but let's just say if you flash flash forward to about a year ago, even uh, uh, the well, a little bit more than a year ago, late 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 2017, uh, we saw some companies come public through the CSE that were American uh, cannabis operators and. Uh, they were able to raise some capital. They were listed on the CSE. You know, they definitely filed. So that you kind of got around that. And, and some of them actually had some revenue. Now, if you move it forward to where we are now, it's unbelievable. You have these companies that are doing $100 million a year or more of revenue. You have companies that have raised, you know, $200 million to $400 million of capital at a time. Uh, it, it's a, and I'm talking about in the United States. Obviously, in Canada, things started to change a little bit earlier because of the federal, the coming federal legality there uh, really uh, sparked that market. So th those are really the, the biggest things: the access to capital, the uh, regulatory improvement, uh, and the exchanges that they trade on, uh, in, in the rev revenue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So. And, and so, okay, so because a lot has changed since, you know, our last interview, April 2016, 
you know, uh, for instance, you know, some management teams now kind of have a track record, you'd say, you know, as an example. So what, what are some criteria then that you look at when you're assessing a potential investment? I mean, have they changed since our first interview? Yeah. So, you know, I used to talk about, you know, it's, it's basically the same things, but yes, it's changed. I used to talk about getting to know the people and, and being aware of their finances, right? Those mm-hmm. are kind of two of the main things. And then also, you know, understanding the business model. Uh, so these are all still the, the right uh, way to look at the companies, but, but they've, the dynamics in each of them have changed. So the people part has gotten amazing. So it used to be, you know, all you really knew was the CEO. And ob- honestly, my criterion was, is the guy a felon or not? <laughs> it was sad, but <laughs> that's really, there was some truth to that. Like, you know, is the person just not a crook? And now we've gotten, you know, you can look at companies that have, uh, you know, the people are very visible. Let me give you an example. So Certera, a private company uh, out of Georgia that has licenses in Florida, Texas. I think they just announced the acquisition in Michigan. So one of these multi-state operators, uh, that's what they're called these days, MSOs in the United States. And are they – sorry, one more thing. Are they a client on uh, New Cannabis Ventures? No. Okay. So uh, Certera, this private company uh, – that's operating out of Georgia with licenses in Florida, Texas, and I believe Massachusetts. Uh, they had an investor come in. His name is Bo Wrigley, is, is in Wrigley Chewing Gum, and he's now running that company. And this is a good example of the caliber of people. Now, uh, we have a client at New Cannabis Ventures, Green Growth Brands. I don't have an investment in it. Uh, and they just went public up in, through Canada. They're backed by the Schottenstein family. The Schottensteins are the people behind DSW, for instance, and American Eagle. So the industry, so the people part is getting fascinating because it's, it's gone from like, are these crooks to like, wow, these, these are people that have long track records, very visible publicly, and we can evaluate them. So that part's changed. And then on the money part, I mean, I have to say, you know, if you go back a few years ago, I was always hoping these companies would, would, get to revenue generation or substantial revenue generation. But for the most part, it was always expectations. You can now look in, you should be looking forward, but you can also look in a rear view mirror, which is really cool. This company had $28 million of revenue last quarter, period. And so uh, I've had to raise the bar in terms of how I look at companies. Uh, I start to question if a company has been around for a long time and they don't have a certain level of revenue. I think that's now a red flag, whereas before it wasn't. And so the, the, the business plan part, uh, that, that hasn't really changed that much. I mean, still a lot of what's going on in the cannabis space, these are almost VC companies, even, even though they're revenue generating now, uh, they're, they're just, they're truly still in the startup mode. If you ask them and where they are compared to where they may be headed, it, it, it's, they're just getting started. Mm-hmm. So, Alan, so in, in your last article from the from the microcap review titled, uh, and I quote, Investors Warm Up to U.S. Cannabis Companies, uh, which was published in October last year, uh, you mentioned how Senator Cory Gardner, a Republican from Colorado, worked out an agreement with President Trump to introduce legislation to protect the rights of states to oversee cannabis regulation with Trump's support. So what what is the significance of this development and where are we at currently when it comes to regulation in cannabis? Yep. So this this was a game changer potentially, and I, I want to caution that uh, years of now six years of watching this space, I've, I've learned not to count on things actually progressing. But mm. uh, just for a little bit of backdrop for people who haven't been following the cannabis uh, uh, industry closely, I mentioned earlier on our in this discussion that uh, the Cole memo came out in late. Uh, August of 2013, and that really paved the way for companies to move forward, and, and not only the companies, but also the state regulators. No, nobody wanted to go to jail, and uh, nobody wanted to have their assets seized. So the Cole Memo was a pretty simple document. Unfortunately, it wasn't a law. It was guidance from President Obama in his administration, and that was the key problem. And so when Trump uh, was elected, there were some questions about what his policy might be, how things might change, who the attorney general was, was very important. He appointed somebody who was known to be literally on the planet Earth, 
one of the top three people against cannabis. And so there was a lot of fear. And that appointment was in early 2017. But Jeff Sessions didn't do anything until early 2018. And he really deflated not only the stock prices, but also the, the morale of the industry because he ripped up that coal memo, which uh, was always a risk. People are aware of it, but it's uh, uh, but it hit. And so uh, this deal that you were just talking about uh, came to surf- surface in April of 2018. And what happened uh, from my understanding of it is that Cory Gardner, a Republican, was blocking Donald Trump uh, in his uh, uh Department of Justice appointments. And so it was just politics and it had nothing to do with cannabis. And, uh, and I don't even remember why Cory Gardner was so upset, but he is a big cannabis advocate uh, uh, politically. And so they apparently reached this deal. It's not in writing. There's no proof of it. And it's hardly ever discussed by, by President Trump. I think there was one of his uh, staff people said it was true. And that's pretty much the extent of it. Why it's important is because the cannabis industry, uh, you know, operates in this weird situation where it's a highly regulated industry where you have to be super compliant at the state and even the local levels, but it's a big question mark at the federal level. And so uh, the States Act would get rid of several problems and uh, you know, everybody's kind of familiar with the banking problem. The banking problem is on two levels. One, what to do with all the cash. A lot of institutions, uh, they're, they're allowed to take the cash, but they choose not to because they, they fear that they could run afoul of federal law. Uh, it, it, there's two pieces uh, that they need to cover, which is know your customer and any money laundering laws. And so uh, there are plenty of banks that will accept deposits, but a lot of banks won't because they're just concerned that they're taking on some liability. But it goes deeper than that because the cannabis industry can't get traditional bank debt like mortgage lending. Investment bankers are afraid to uh, to, to cover the industry and, and uh, take money from these companies. So, so that's a piece of it. There, there's other pieces as well. Uh, uh, 280E taxation is this – relic of the 80s. It was uh, a law that 280E was a law that was created basically to collect taxes from cocaine uh, smugglers. And it's been applied to the cannabis industry. And essentially what it says is uh, you have to pay taxes on everything uh, on your gross profits. That's the right way to say it. So basically you take your revenue and you take your cost of goods. So if you advertise, if you buy insurance for your employees, anything like that, these are non-deductible expenses. And consequently, cannabis companies can lose money but still have to pay a lot in federal income tax. And so that's another piece that, that would potentially go away. So I, I think what I try to tell people at 420 Investor is that there's a lot of upside if this thing passes. But it's not the end of the world if it doesn't. What's important is is that the federal government keeps its hands off. And, th- and that's been the policy for many years now. There's been no federal intervention at all into the state legal cannabis operations. And so status quo is actually pretty good, Bobby. That's the point I try to make. Uh-huh. So I, I think I actually read an article not too long ago about there have been some discussions about the changing of uh, – of cannabis as a Schedule One um, narcotic. I mean, have you seen anything about that? Because I mean, that's really the big. That that's kind of like the first domino to fall, I think, for everything, in, in my opinion. Well, so this is an interesting topic as well because uh, the federal government right now says that. Uh, well, I can't remember if it's heroin or cocaine. I think it's cocaine. Like cocaine, uh, cannabis has no health benefits and is dangerous. I think heroin's actually. Uh, at a slightly lower they, – they, they break it into, I believe, five different areas. So Schedule 1 is what I just described, mm-hmm. no health benefits and dangerous. And so heroin is, is better than cannabis apparently. <laughs> so first of all, we can all kind of challenge this because there's a lot of anecdotal evidence out there that would tell you there are health benefits and there's not a lot of evidence uh, really that there's tremendous dangers. It's really – you know. Perry Passu to alcohol, probably better. It's, it has some health benefits. Alcohol, I drink red wine. It has Reservatrol. But beyond that, I'm not sure there's any benefits. But I, I know for a fact that people have benefited from cannabis. But with that said, 
let's take it to the next level. The federal government, the FDA, approved a cannabis-derived drug last year. Mm -hmm. Well, this is like so obvious that there's a health benefit and that the because the federal government said there's a health benefit. So, and that's GW Pharma's Epidiolex. So you have this situation right now where uh, it's Schedule 1. I mentioned this 280E taxation thing. That applies to Schedule 1 and Schedule 2 drugs. So if for some reason the federal government were to change the schedule to 3, that would be a, a very big win for the industry potentially. But I have to tell you a dirty secret. Most of the industry does not want – for business reasons. They may want it for personal social justice reasons and all that, but their businesses do better when it's federally illegal. Uh, hmm. it, it's a barrier to entry. Uh, and so they, they're able to – What I think the perfect scenario for these uh, multi-state operators or MSOs is to build their very complex state-by-state -state businesses. And then in a few years, we get federal legalization and they're able to sell out to you know Philip Morris or whoever it is that wants to be a big cannabis operator. So that's 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 the dirty secret of the industry. And uh, you know, it, there's a there's another problem. If they were to change the scheduling right now, we might see the federal government also say, guess what? We don't like the dispensary model. You're going to have to buy your cannabis from Walgreens or CVS. I mean, that is a possibility. So. Uh, I think uh, these are things to be aware of. I don't spend – I don't lose a lot of sleep over this because the wheels of justice or the way the federal government works, it's slow, very slow. Or, and I, or I not even work at all. They're just exactly, shut down. Right now. <laughs> so, sure. Yeah, right. So, so the reality – what I tell people, 420 Investor, is whatever is going to happen in the future, it's going to take a while because look, – look at how long it took in Canada. It was October of 2015 – when Justin Trudeau got elected and with a promise to legalize. And it was three years later that somebody made the first sale, almost to the date. So I think Canada's easier than the United States because we have all these states that have all this tax revenue. Uh, you have the 280E issue. There's just a lot of things that need to be worked out. Uh, and I, I think it's going to take a while before they actually – uh, make this thing federally legal. So I, I think we'll have plenty of time to figure it out, and uh, the path ahead won't be so certain, in my opinion, uh, at all. So I, I think, like I said earlier, status quo is awesome. Some of these changes could really work out well, but at the same time, everybody needs to be aware that you know some of the changes may not work out well at all. Mm -hmm. So you actually, I wanted to follow up on one thing that you said in there, and, and that actually had to do with my next question regarding how this past year we saw the FDA approve the first plant-derived cannabinoid medicine with from GW Pharma with Epidiolex. You know, so you you did you know you touched on you know why this is important and and how this is game changing, but you know let's let's also put this in perspective. You know, what does this mean for let's say? the biotech industry and, and cannabis, you know, what, what, what's game changing to them now? Is, is there more clinical trials now that can be approved to actually happen? You know, what, what does this mean? Yeah. The whole thing was really interesting to me because when GW Pharma went public, I started following it from when they went public back in, uh, believe it or not, August of 2013 when I launched mm -hmm. and, or may actually, but you know, I was following the space. So they've been around a while and Epidiolex, which is this, uh, the drug that was approved that's, uh, to treat, uh, rare forms of epilepsy seizures, you know, from ep childhood epilepsy, uh, that wasn't even really on the table. So what was really cool about this whole process was how quickly, cause we all hear how it takes 15 years or something right, to yeah. develop a drug. And this was very fast. I mean, I, things got a little stretched out uh, at, at the at the finish line, so I, I think it was longer than quote unquote three years. But it was really about three years, uh, I think, from when they uh, first uh, started really working on this to when they submitted it for FDA approval. And uh, so I think that's an interesting dynamic in and of itself. So what what this means for the whole industry, which right now struggles because you, because it's a federally illegal substance, 
it's very difficult to do research in the United States. And GW Pharma did do it. It's just very difficult to do it. And we've seen a lot of studies get stymied for, for many reasons. Uh, there's a monopoly provider of cannabis, uh, the University of Mississippi, and it, it's, it's terrible. And so to just do general research has been very hard uh, for, for anybody trying to study uh, the safety and efficacy of cannabis. And uh, so now you have a, 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 a you know, multi-billion dollar market cap company that has a product on the market. Uh, and I think it, it really becomes interesting. I think there's paths for big pharma to get into cannabis pretty easily. They can acquire GW Pharma. So that's one answer to your question. We may see that. Uh, and they're pretty unique, GW Pharma. Uh, I don't think there's anybody anywhere near them in terms of their intellectual property uh, or certainly that has a drug approved. But there's also the whole Canadian industry. And I, I've been talking to a lot of the CEOs in Canada about, uh, you know, that they should uh, talk to GW Pharma and, and be a part of GW Pharma. And I've, you know, I've mentioned GW Pharma. I don't get any investment banking fees, unfortunately, if this happens. But uh, I think <laughs> it would make a lot of sense for pharmaceutical companies in general to maybe look at buying a Canadian licensed producer where it's federally legal and they can, the path to research would be so much easier. And there is some IP actually out there already. Uh, and then you also have a situation in, in Canada and also other parts of the world, Bobby, like Germany and others where insurance is covering, uh, not so much yet in, in Canada, but uh, definitely in Germany, insurance pays for medical cannabis. And hmm. so there, there really is a, a potential, potential uh, model. A lot of people don't understand. They think that cannabis is cannabis is cannabis, but there's actually a lot of science that, that will be done and some is being done. And uh, I, I think it's like a layup. And I'm pretty sure by the you know, if the next time we talk, hopefully it'll be in a year, but maybe two years, uh, that we this will have happened. We will see a large pharmaceutical company uh, buy a Canadian licensed producer where it's federally legal, and uh, and I expect that to happen. So then, for like some of these smaller microcaps, because we've entered a we've interviewed a few companies that you know are are using. Um, you know, the, the cannabinoid, uh, uh, plant derived cannabinoids to treat other forms of uh, cancer diseases out there. You know, how come, how did GW able to get something so fast tracked? You know, you, because in some of these companies that we've, that I've interviewed over the last year or so, you know, they don't have that same fast track designation, you know, so it's like, okay, well, they got it quickly, but. You know, what What about all these other ones that might be treating like the, the glaucomas of the world and all, all these other types of uh, issues? Yeah. So I'm not an expert in this. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to be a little bit more expert in because uh, I covered healthcare mm -hmm. as an institutional uh, money manager. But uh, so part, you know, they got orphan status, which I think really helped. Mm, so, I see. so keep in mind, uh, while, while there are treatments for epilepsy out there, it's still uh, not very well controlled. And so... Uh, I, I think that was a big part of why they were able to do it so quickly. Uh, another piece of it, not, not necessarily to do with anything from a regulatory standpoint, but I also think that these guys really had their ducks in a row mm -hmm. and uh, they were a very good team. They, they did things quickly and their clinical trials were done right. They, they, they stumbled with another drug, Sativex. Uh, not sure if it was their fault or not. Sometimes uh, stuff happens. But uh, uh, I think your listeners need to understand, while this was a very rapid success story in, in terms of taking it from the uh, starting line to the finish line, GW Pharma has been at it since 1998 and public since 2001. So mm -hmm. it's uh, not an easy uh, task to, to get any drug approved. And I, I think they just executed actually very well here. I see. All right, so uh, the, this is this question I think is is pretty important because you know even though the market has matured and very much changed in the last you know three years and, and even six years since you got your start you know looking at this industry, there's still things that you know you you want to look out for you know and there's still some some uh, things that people might try and take advantage of because they've seen this last year really explode you know, in terms of the, the cannabis industry, in terms of eyeballs and also investment. So what would you say are some things to look out for now 
you know, here right now, January 2019, you know, when assessing a potential cannabis investment? Yeah, well, unfortunately, uh, one of the things that's still prominent in the industry, just like another example flashed across my email just now as we're talking. <laughs> I'm not going to name names, but uh, this stupid stock promotion company promotion company is being paid $63,000 per month from the company for a total of a year to basically to pump the stock. Mm. And uh, so so I, I think, you know, look, I've done my best to create a, a very credible website that's free to the public uh, where if they want to learn about the real industry, we only cover real companies. But unfortunately, there's still a lot of noise, Bobby, and there's there's stock promoters out there. It's still very penny stockish, and that company I just mentioned is actually listed in Canada. So it's not just in the United States on the OTC. It's also in Canada, and uh, so I, I think that everybody needs to be aware of uh, not so much just the stock promotion, but to understand kind of the mentality. Uh, this market has become much more institutional, and I think that that will – serve retail investors very well mm -hmm. to have these institutions out there investing in the market, but they're not investing in every single cannabis stock. And I think retail investors need to understand that there's a lot of penny stock games that go on, whether it's the stock promotion or uh, just other shenanigans that just make it really hard for the retail investor to win in certain stocks. And thankfully, that universe is becoming a smaller and smaller part of the overall sector. Mm -hmm. So then this is a, my favorite question to ask. And I have to alter it a little bit because, you know, as you said, you've never made a, a you've never owned a, a cannabis stock. So I'd say, you know, let's say in the last three years, you know, what experience in covering this industry or the market uh, in cannabis has taught you the most, you'd say, and, and really maybe helped guided your, your process in, in analyzing this space going forward? Yeah, you know, a couple of things. Uh, let me tell you, let me split it and give you two totally different answers. So, uh, look, I'm a professional investor. I came into this never, I didn't even know what penny stocks and over the counter was. So I had a lot of learning to do. And uh, I came into this at a very hot time in the market. In early 2014, a lot of stocks went up uh, 10x, 15x. And uh, a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of people bought in after that and, and they thought that this was sustainable. And I, I definitely made some mistakes early on. And part of it was kind of my lack of familiarity and understanding some of the penny stock games that I've learned more about. Uh, and e even though I was trying to look out for certain things, uh, I, I maybe fell short of my, uh, my goals. And so I, I definitely learned a lot back then. And, and I think people can still learn now about some of these penny stock things to look out for. So that, that, that's one side of it. But let me tell you another side. So my background was, uh, I guess you might call it growth at a reasonable price. We didn't, we didn't call it that, but just to put it in a bucket. And so, uh, so what that means is you're looking for good companies, but you don't want to pay too much. Well, when you're in a hot sector, like the cannabis space, that may not be the best way to go about things. And I've had to really learn that lesson. And there have been some companies, uh, you know, outside the cannabis space for sure for me, like I never understood Amazon and yet it just kept going up, 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 up. But in the cannabis space, I've really had to kind of alter my own personal bias against valuation sometimes. So hmm. I, I've reached this point where my, my subscribers understand exactly what I'm saying. And I've, I've really changed my messaging a little bit. Like in the past, I might have said, stay away from this. It's too expensive. Now my messaging is more like, this company is a good company. I think the stock's very expensive. Oh, is a reminder. I said the same thing about Amazon for years. So, you know, just because I think it's expensive doesn't mean that the stock can't go up or that they could grow into the valuation. So th these have been two of the many things maybe that, that I could answer. Mm -hmm. That's so, I feel like I could do a whole interview just talking about that in and of itself because that I mean that's that's a that's a lot of self awareness right there. Oh my God! Well, <laughs> look, I, I had people, they, maybe a few blamed me, but uh, I, I think an honest assessment by anybody would just say, "Hey, I tried to warn you, you didn't listen." But I, I had suicidal people back in 2014, mm -hmm. and when you have people that are telling you their stories about how they 
were, you know, borrowed all this money and put it into cannabis. Even I warned and warned about uh, putting all your money and, you know, all your eggs in one basket. But when you've heard those those stories, uh, it really changes the way you present information, I would say. Mm -hmm. And what's really great, by the way, some of these people that weren't suicidal necessarily, but that really lost their their ass badly, uh, they ended up making money in the long term that, you know, maybe they had to put more money in, but when it was all said and done, some of these people that really learned some tough lessons about speculation back in 2014 have done exceedingly well. And, you know, I'm, that's one of the things I'm proudest about. Mm -hmm. So I have to ask too, because it seems like it's also, uh, it seems like with every big, you know, federal announcement or, or, or a uh, coal memo this, or, you know, uh, GW Pharma passing a drug that, you know, it, there's like this wave of enthusiasm that happens, you know, around that each time, you know, so what should uh, uh, my audience then really look out for really in, in during these times of, you know, uh, quote unquote, black swan events, because it just, it seems like there's, there's that wave of enthusiasm because something was just passed or whatever. And then, you know, it comes down and then another wave of enthusiasm, yep. you know, like, so where, where does, where's it going to settle? You know, yep. it, it's, it's craziness. It seems like in those moments. So there have been some great examples of how you needed to to fade the market at certain times. And sometimes you really need to like pay attention to the events. And I think one of the best things I, I, I did in the first five years of uh, 420 Investor was when that news – okay, first of all, I always warned that Jeff Sessions could, uh, could rain on our parade. Mm -hmm. And Bobby, it was literally 15 minutes for me to – I have I had three model portfolios at the time. One of them was allowed to go to all cash. One was allowed to have twenty percent cash. One was allowed to have thirty percent cash. When that news hit, there were a lot of people. They're like, "Ah, this will blow over." I immediately went to hundred percent cash, twenty percent cash, and thirty percent cash in those accounts, respectively, model mm -hmm. portfolios. And I tried to tell people, "It's like, look, this is going. You know, you're you're hearing this right now immediately. Wait till everybody else hears about it." And it was brutal. But I got it all invested about 25, 35% lower a few days later. And so that was a good example of where you really have to be prepared to act uh, with the news. But more often than not, you know, I guess it goes both ways as I think about it. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been two, two rallies in the last uh, few years that were easy to predict, certainly on the front end. Uh, I got one of them perfect on both the front end and the back end. The, the back end of the other one was hard. These were the the uh, election rally in, in late 2016. I, I literally called it to the day. Uh, I said that you know once we came back from uh, from Labor Day, uh, the market a market rally would take off because people were going to be excited about this. And you know everybody knew about it. It wasn't a huge secret, but yet it worked out really really well. And I got the exit pretty darn close. I said you know sell out. A day or two before or after the elections, and that proved to be the right thing to do. Uh, but the next one was what I called the Cali Rally, and it got a little bit messed up by Constellation Brands investing in Canopy Growth and kind of getting the market frothy a little bit uh, before that. But on that one, I, I, I mean, I had this weird date, December 11th, and you can go back and look on the chart. And so the market already rallied a little bit. I'd share that date in June, by the way. Mm -hmm. But uh, and so because of because of what happened in August, the market had rallied a little bit, but it took off in – I'm sorry, in October, not August. So, it, so it, it actually started a little earlier than I expected because of this what I call a green swan event where Constellation decided <laughs> to invest in canopy growth. But the exit there was tougher uh, because that's when that Jeff Sessions coal memo rescission took place. and. Mm. The, the market had done what I expected it to do. We have chat every Wednesday night, or actually it's now Tuesdays, but it was then Wednesday. And somebody said, hey, Alan, you know, the market's hit your level. What do you think now? And I was like, you know, I, you're right. It hit my level, but it, I think there's still a little bit of time left. And it was literally the next morning where Jeff Sessions pulled the rug out. So I, I don't have a crystal ball. Of course. But, so so the, the point is, the, why I'm spending so much time talking about this is you, you need to think ahead. You, and so I think retail investors, and that may be a large part of your audience here listening, they they sometimes don't realize that they're the ones that are buying when everybody else is ready to sell. 
and, and so it's the peak of the moment. So I, I like to think of the – notice how I said you want to sell around the election. That's when the good news was going to come out, and it was great news. And so you know, the Cali rally, you have to think ahead. When are people going to start to process the news? And, uh, and so that – I think that's a tough thing for, for people who aren't experienced in investing to understand that the buy the news – I'm sorry, buy the rumor, sell the news. I know you've heard that before, but maybe people haven't heard it, but it's so, so helpful. Mm -hmm. So Alan, uh, unless, like, unless the news isn't expected, like the Jeff Sessions thing. Right, right, right. So, so Alan, you know, like I said, I know we could go on for forever here, but, uh, but I think uh, we'll cap it there. So, so Alan, where, where can my audience go and find more information about you, New Cannabis Ventures and 420 Investor? Sure. So I always like to start with New Cannabis Ventures because it's 100% free to the public, easy to find, and you'll be able to also find other ways to connect. So that's just NewCannabisVentures.com. And by the way, not, not only is it news, but we have some great resources there that help people track the market. We have uh, six indices now, two of which are real-time. Uh, we have uh, an IPO calendar. We have an earnings call calendar. So we continue to add a lot of features uh, to that. And then the other place, the subscription service, which isn't for everybody, but it, uh, the people that are there sure love it. That's uh, 420investor.com. That's 420-I-N-V-E-S-T-O-R.com. Alan, thank you so much for joining me today. It's always a pleasure talking with you and uh, catching up. And uh, I, I'm excited for the next update. All right. Sounds great. Thank you, Bobby. All right. Talk to you soon. Thank you all for tuning in to the Planet Microcap podcast, and thank you, Alan, again for coming on to the program. You can access the podcast by going on to stocknewsnow.com under podcast, go to podbean.com and search Planet Microcap podcast, or on iTunes and search Planet Microcap podcast. Stay tuned for the next Planet Microcap podcast, where we'll have our next guest discuss all things microcap. If you have any questions or comments about the podcast, please send an email to info at snnwire.com. I'd love to hear from all of you. This podcast has been brought to you by SNN Incorporated, publishers of StockNewsNow.com, the official microcap news source, and the Microcap Review Magazine. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and thank you again for joining me on the Planet Microcap Podcast. Have a great week, everyone.